a very exciting time, and I'm excited about the message that I have for you this morning. If you are a youth student, you've already heard part of this message. Uh, this morning, the message is titled, Prayer Warrior. A lot of people have used this phrase. A lot of people go by this phrase. They are prayer warriors. We have plenty of them here, and they're amazing. Specifically, the subject of prayer warriors, how do you pray on a deeper level? The story that I'm pulling from this morning is 1 Samuel 1. On there, it's listed 3 through 20. If you're writing it down in your notes as if you're going to read it later, that's awesome. You might as well just start with 120, because the first three verses are really just an explanation of who this person's husband is. The story is about a man, uh, sorry, not a man, it's about a woman named Hannah. Hannah is the mother of Samuel, hence first Samuel. The story reads, first of all, before I get to the story, let me give you a little of a backdrop. <laughs> Hannah is without child. She has never been able to have a child. She's tried for years. She's prayed for years with no avail, hoping that God would hear her and give her the blessing of a son. And this is where our story starts. Year after year, this man, which is her husband, Elkanah, year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophna and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of his meat to his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters. But Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. When Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and she would not eat. Her husband, Elkna, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in, Sh in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting in his chair by the doorstep of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is, in, who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went home on her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home. Elkna made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. I realize I read that very fast for you. So I hope you caught it all. <laughs> I want to tell you a story apart from this Bible story here, and it's one from my own life. I was a 10th grader at summer camp, and I remember I prayed like Hannah did, desperately at an altar. I was so hungry for more, and I prayed, and I prayed, and as you could have seen from this morning, sometimes altar calls go a little longer, and so this altar call stretched on a lot longer than it was intended to. The altar call at the end of the evening was supposed to be about an hour long. Typically at camp, everything's just way longer. Well, the altar call kept going, and I said, I'm not leaving, I'm not leaving yet, I'm still here. And it kept going, and it kept going, and then eventually it came time for an event to happen in the building, and we were still there during altar call. 
And so they said, hey, we got to take you out of here and put you in a different building for altar call. So we left the building and we went to another building to continue altar call somewhere else because we were there for that long. Four hours later, our altar call finally ended. Eventually, I received the answers from God that I was looking for, but the moral of it was that it came in God's own timing and not my own. It would have been amazing if I would have just said, God, give me the answer. And he said, okay, here it is. And I said, thanks, awesome. I'm going to Snack Shack and I'm buying Bosco sticks. Thank you, Jesus. Right? It would have been amazing if he would have just done that. And then I would have been like, okay, cool. I got my answers and I'm off. But that's not how it happened. It happened in his own timing and it happened in his own timing for a reason. To teach me that I'm not in control and to teach me that he's got an answer, but it's going to come when it's time for it to come. So first off, I want to tell you why I'm talking about praying on a deeper level. Why should we want to pray on a deeper level? Because as a believer, as someone with a relationship with Christ, it should be our goal, our honest desire, to have a deeper and more honest conversation with God. So how do we do that? How do we pray on a deeper level? I've got three things, and I promise they'll be quicker. These are designed for youth students, but this is changed for big people. (laughs) So, the first step is to pray intentionally and pray often. In the story of Hannah's prayer, in the story of Hannah's struggle, in the hopes to eventually receive her son Samuel, she prayed for years, right? It said years and years she prayed and she earnestly sought. Years and years, Hannah would pray often. And every one of those years, she was not given the response she wanted from God, yet she continued and pursued with the same passion and the same, the same heart that she did from the start. Despite of what the world was saying around her, remember, Her husband's other wife was the entire time mocking her and and putting her down like, you're never going to receive the child you're looking for. But she still continued to pray intentionally and often. And this is a really important part of the story about God's timing with your prayer. You see, it's really important to remember that God made her wait for a reason. Because, just like my story, if God would have just gave me an answer, and I could have went and gone and got Bosco sticks, I would have got my answer and Bosco sticks, and I was happy. But instead, he made me wait, and I learned a lesson from it. Similar in this story, Hannah is praying for a son. If she would have gotten the son first try, she would have raised a beautiful young son. She would have raised him right. He would have grown up to be a great man. But because she waited, and she became desperate to receive an answer from God. She she became so earnestly, she, she wanted it so bad. She got to a point where she said, God, if you give me this son, I'll devote him to you. She went further than just, God, give me a son. She said, God, if you give me the son that I've been asking for all of this time, I will devote him to you. And now it takes place. Now God grants her the answer she's looking for. It's important to remember, if she didn't have to desire for it for that long, she would have got it right at the beginning. She never would have made the vow, God, I'm going to devote him to you. A razor will never touch his head. He will be yours. Now that she's reached this point, God gives her the son. Why is this important? Because the son she raises is Samuel. If Samuel was not devoted to God at the beginning from the start and raised in his childhood the way he was, Samuel never would have went on to become a prophet. Samuel never would have went on to see King Saul for what he really was. Samuel never would have went on and said, we need to get Saul out of this kingdom. We need to go find a new king. He never would have found David. David would have never fought Goliath. David never would have taken up a mantle in the kingdom. And it's really important to remember that David is a king of Israel who is listed in the genealogy of Jesus. David is a relative of Jesus. From David, his line came Jesus. I know I'm stretching real far here, away from the point of Samuel, but I hope you're following me. If Samuel was never devoted to God from the start, 
None of these things would have happened. We never would have gotten to David. David never would have said, God, I want to build you a temple. And God never would have said, no, I want to build you a temple. And I want to make a king that rules over Israel and brings my kingdom down. Hannah's waiting had a purpose and a massive plan. <laughs> His timing was perfect. He had to be born at this time. He had to be devoted. He had to grow up in this. And in the end, Hannah's waiting was a part of God's perfect and divine plan. So pray intentionally and pray often. Even when you're not receiving answers, remember the timing of the answer is perfect for you and it's far better than we could have ever decided or imagined. The second thing I have for you is to slow down. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. It says, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. If you remember, pagans, they would often pray and repeat the same phrases over and over again. They would also repeat the name of their gods over and over again. They would chant. They would do all of these things in hope that they would be recognized from God, that, that their words would be the way that their prayers would be answered. Jesus, in this verse, is reminding the people that your words are not the focus of your prayer. The words that you say aren't inherently bad. It's the words that are coming from your heart that's important. The reason I bring up this verse in this point to slow down is because sometimes when we pray and we get very passionate, we start to speed up. I don't know if you've ever done it, but I can tell you I've done it, where I've started to pray and I started to speed up and sometimes I'm like, I don't even really know the words I'm saying anymore. I'm just praying with intensity. And sometimes when that happens, our words no longer become intentional and they become rote and they become rhythm. I know these are the words I'm supposed to say, so I'm going to say it. But now that I'm speaking faster than my mind can think, I'm just going to keep saying it and I'm going to keep saying it. And I'm no longer feeling the prayer I'm saying. I'm no longer thinking the prayer. I'm just reciting it. A lot of times, I call this certain phrase Christian ums. Christian ums are when you're praying so fast, so intensely, or, you don't, or you're still thinking about words to say, but you don't want to slow down and stop. You start to say, God, Father, Lord, Heavenly Father. Nothing wrong with these words. Those are pretty amazing words, I would say. But have you ever listened to someone pray, trying to stay up with a certain pace, and it sounds a little something like, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that you would just bless us, Jesus, and Lord Jesus, that you would just... <laughs> Christian ums. <laughs> Christian ums. There's nothing wrong with it, and I bet you now that I've said it, you're going to notice, ooh, I kind of do that sometimes. I kind of do that sometimes. It's a hard habit to break. But the reason I say it is because I, the, the goal is to slow down and let your words be intentional. Let the words that come out of your mouth not just be words to fill, the, to fill the blank space. Remember that your prayer comes from your heart. So let the words that come from your heart be intentional in your prayer. Slow down. Let the words that come out be honest from your heart and intentional from your head. And just like that, I'm already on point three. If you're a youth student... You've heard this, but you haven't heard it spoken like this yet. You see, in youth group, this entire message, each point is a week of youth group. This last point, we did this last Wednesday. We're going to do another point from this message, another Wednesday, and another point, and another Wednesday. We're teaching our kids how to pray on a deeper level in this church. And when I tell you it was amazing this last Wednesday... I am not exaggerating when I say there were kids praying throughout the entire room. The room was full of kids honestly and earnestly seeking God. And the third point I have for you is use your words. 
there's a phrase that I'm sure everybody's heard and had probably almost a similar reaction to. It's a very simple phrase, and it's just, so who wants to pray? <laughs> and you get a lot of this in, in every group, almost. There's always one person. Who wants to pray? No one's volunteering yet. I mean, I would. Give, give it 10 seconds. That'll do it. 10 more, 10 more seconds. Oh, you did it. All right, cool. <laughs> right? <laughs> or, or if you were me in youth group, I, I took a different route in youth group when I was scared to pray. They said, who wants to pray? And I just looked right at them. <laughs> I'm calling your bluff. You won't do it. You're not going to pick me, Elijah. <laughs> right? The point of this is everybody has heard the phrase, who wants to pray? And everybody gets nervous, right? Because, oh, p public prayer. I'm like, I, uh, what if I say something wrong? It's really hard to talk to Jesus wrong. He's pretty open to hearing you. I want to say first, though, before I continue with it, that there's nothing wrong with being nervous about praying out loud. It's, it can be scary, and there's nothing wrong with you if you're not at a point yet where you feel comfortable to do it. I don't want to make you think that I'm looking down on you or I'm telling you it's not enough yet. If you're not there yet, the whole point of this is a call to something deeper. It's not saying this is the way to pray. It's a call to something deeper. Because we see in Hannah's story, Hannah was praying earnestly, but the words weren't coming out of her mouth. So there's still power in your silent prayers, right? So why am I saying pray out loud, right? Why am I saying learn to pray out loud, right? I have two reasons. And the first one is this, is when you pray out loud, you expand your comfort zone with Christ. Why is that important? Because as a believer, all of us, not just me, not just one person, not a couple people, every believer is called to make disciples, is called to reach out, is called to grow themselves and the people around them. If you want to pray for somebody to receive Christ, if you get them right there, they're like, I want to give my life to Christ, let's pray. Jesus saved them. Uh, Jesus, they love you. It's happened before, I can tell you I've done it. And you almost just have to say, hey, look, I am not a great prayer out loud, but we're going to pray honestly, right? But learn to pray out loud. Learn to pray out loud from your heart. Expand your comfort zone, because Jesus likes to push you outside of your comfort zone, so you might want to have a bigger one, so that way it's, it's more, right? Have more space in your comfort zone for Jesus to push you even further. That should be a goal in your life. The second one is this. You're going to have to put that slide up, because I don't remember how I worded it. <laughs> the prayers that come out of your mouth have the power to lift not only others up, but yourself. And the verse I have put here is Ephesians 4, 29. It reads, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for edification, or building up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Have you ever had a thought, right, everybody so far can say yes, have you ever had a thought in your head that you believed so strongly in, or an idea or a question that you had, that when you then said it out loud, you were like, ooh, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? I, I believe so strongly in this. I believe in, ooh, wait, I don't, no, that doesn't quite sound like, I don't really believe in the thing that was in my head now that I've said it out of my mouth, right? What happened was you said what was in your head through your mouth, the ears heard it, and then you went, wait, no. So what happened was the words that came out of your mouth went back to your ears, and you learned from them. You, you built up upon them. You said, that was an idea I had, but I no longer have that idea because now I realize this. Just this last summer, we went to senior high camp and junior high camp, and we had a speaker, and he said a phrase every time we saw him, every single time. 
he said the same phrase over and over, pray loud enough that your ears can hear the words coming out of your mouth. And I always was like, okay, that makes sense. And then the longer we did it, the more I realized, oh, it makes a ton of sense. Because now, not only are you praying, you're praying out of your mouth, which requires you to think the words going through your head, which requires you to feel it in your heart to make it come out of your mouth. So the words are hyper-intentional now, and on top of that, you hear yourself communicating with God, and you're building yourself up in the process. So it's absolutely amazing when you can learn to pray out loud, because the more you do it, the more built up you become in the process. And this is the part that was awesome, is we practiced this in youth group on Wednesday. We said, all right, this is what's going to happen. We're going to turn the music up way loud, and the worship team in just a second is going to do it as well. We're going to we're going to do another worship song here, and we're going to turn the volume up way loud, spread out across the room, right? We, if you've ever been downstairs, it's one long room, and we just told our kids, spread out, go everywhere, right? There's no space that's not free, except for the kitchen. Don't go in the kitchen, right? And so kids spread out along the room. We had the lights off. We had our music playing, and I said, look, we're going to turn the music up loud. We're, it's going to be loud. It might be a little too loud for you. But there's a reason why we're going to do it. You're spread out. The music's loud. Nobody can hear the words coming out of your mouth except you. This is your opportunity to practice what you've learned. Pray out loud, loud enough that your ears can hear it, and do it in a space that's safe enough that you don't feel like people around you are going to hear you or judge you or make you feel a certain way because you're learning how to pray for the first time out loud. And there was a moment in this time that we spent with our kids where the music was really loud and kids were really praying and then the music got quieter out of nowhere on them, right? So it's, it was actually make room. It was, you know, shake up the ground of all my tradition. It got real quiet. But what was absolutely awesome was the music got quiet, but the kids didn't. The students heard the music drop and they didn't go, God, I'm praying. Oh, God, I'm praying now that you would just. No, the kids, the kids stayed loud and proud in their prayer. And that's an absolutely awesome thing to experience as a leader, and it's an absolutely awesome thing to hear as a parent or a grandparent. If you don't know what's going on in youth group, some amazing stuff is going on in youth group. Our kids are diving deep. Our kids are pushing themselves to learn more and to go deeper in their relationships. And it's been an absolutely awesome experience because these kids, at the start of it, were like, I don't want to pray out loud. That's freaky. That's scary. But by the time they started going, I just gave them a few one-word, two-word, three-word prompts, right? I just told them, look, how are you going to start your prayer? These are some of the prompts we gave our kids. And they were honest, and they were real, and some of them were heavy. We told the kids, you can start your prayer off like this, right? The first one, God, lately, I've really been struggling with this. Fill in the blank. God, I'm really looking for your guidance in this part of my life. Fill in the blank. My friends, my family, at school, whatever it may be. And then it got a little harder, and it was, it got harder, and the phrase got shorter. It said, God, I just feel like Fill in the blank. And throughout the entire room, every time we had a new prompt, these kids got more and more in-depth with their prayers. Their prayers went from being surface level to being a little deeper until they were having full-on honest conversation with God simply because they opened up their mouth and finally said the words that they were thinking in their head. God, lately, I've really been struggling with peer pressure and anxiety. God, lately... I'm really looking for your guidance in my family life, in my friend groups. God, lately, I just feel like I'm not worth it or I'm not good enough. These kids were starting to have really honest and deep conversations, and a lot of them got some answers from God that night, which was an absolutely awesome experience to see happen. And then you can't ever end on a low note, so we brought them right back up. And the last prompt we gave our students was, God, thank you for this. Because sometimes our prayers can get so down and so sad that we forget God is amazing and God is good. 
So God, thank you for this. Danny, I'm ready. <laughs> These three points seem really simple, and they kind of seem a lot like a just, okay, that's a quick tip, right? And sometimes a quick tip is all you really need to realize how easy it is to speak to your Heavenly Father. <laughs> it is so simple. The God who created the universe, he created every mountain, every sea, every canyon, every living being. He created everything. He exists outside of time. He exists with nothing but time for you. And we sometimes feel like we've only got 10 minutes with him. Sometimes we feel like, oh, I've only got time for this 10-minute altar call that we're about to experience in church. Or, oh, I've only got time before I go to bed to speak with him. He has got nothing but time for you. He has got all of the time in the world, all at your disposal, all at his disposal. And he's right there ready to listen at any given moment. You say, God, I really need to talk to you. And there he is. He's ready to listen. He wants to be that father to you. He wants to be that friend to you. He has advice, and he has guidance, and he has wisdom, and he has a perfect time and a plan for your life, and it is all right there. And we sometimes just feel like, ah, I gotta say it real quick, I gotta say it real fast, because I've only got 10 minutes before this song ends. And oh, I'm just gonna speak really, really fast and get every word out that I'm thinking. And we forget to just slow down and remember, you've got all the time in the world to hear me pray to you, Jesus. You've got all the time in the world to hear everything that I have on my heart. You can take all my pain, all my suffering. You can take all my sadness and all my joy. You have it all. And I just want to speak to you this morning. Because now is a call to action for you. Because I can tell you, it's scary at first, and once you get going, your fear fades away. To give you an honest and real actual story, last night I was very restless before I came here this morning. I, I actually had a bit of anxiety before coming here that I had never really experienced before speaking. And I remember tossing and turning in my bed, going, oh no, what if I, what if I preach heresy, right? What if I mess up entirely? And, and screw up the whole message. All of these thoughts going through my head. And then I felt the Holy Spirit just nudge me a little bit. And the Holy Spirit was just telling me, why are you thinking this right now when you're going to call everybody to pray out loud tomorrow? And I was like, oh, you got me there. You got me there. So I had to practice what I was going to preach the next day. And last night, I laid in bed, and I just said, God, I love you so much, and I want to do everything that you have designed for me, and I want to do it to the best of my ability. I believe you have your hand in tomorrow as you had it in today. Would you just ease my restless heart? And I didn't have a hand of experience where I had to wait years. God said, now you listen. Now you did it. Go to bed. And I went to bed. And I woke up early this morning ready to speak this word from him. So if you're looking for proof that it works, there you go. Right? If you're looking for proof that it works, look at Hannah. She prayed and he responded. He did it in his own timing and she prayed honestly from her heart. But this morning I'm encouraging you and I'm challenging and pushing you a little bit. That when this song starts, you know this song, it can get a little loud. Remember those prompts that I said that you might be thinking, right? God, lately I've really been struggling with this. Start your prayer off like that. God, lately I've been looking for your guidance in my family. My kids, I just don't know what to do. I feel like I'm losing control. Father, I pray you give me guidance in my friend groups, Father. I feel like I'm alone in them, that I'm the only one who's a Christian and really cares. I feel alone when I go to church because I have a group of people in my life that I wish were sitting right next to me right now. 
I just wish you would touch their heart and bring them here. God, I just feel like every time I start, I don't have the motivation to continue. Whatever the prayer and thought on your heart is, let it out. Say it out loud. God can hear you. He can feel you. He understands you. Say the words and make it real to yourself. Sometimes all you got to do is just get the first few words out and the whole thing comes out. We had kids the other night who were anxious to pray, scared to pray, and the moment they started speaking, they didn't want to stop. They just kept going. They had so much they had to tell God that they just had never said out loud, and it became so real to them in the process. Afterwards, I talked to them, and they said, I feel like a burden's been lifted and I'm lighter. Like, I'm like, I feel like I could go for a run. There's so much joy in edifying yourself that this morning, that's the call for you. Let that be what you come up to the altar with. The music's going to be loud. Nobody's going to hear your words. It can be a whisper. It can be a shout. But let it be loud enough that your own ears can hear it. Make it real to yourself. Father, thank you for this morning and that we get the opportunity to speak to you whenever it is we need you. You're there for us all the time. And we want to search and find you in every space of our lives. This morning we're coming to you with the hopes of going deeper. The hopes of having real and honest conversation with you. The hopes that you would give us guidance and wisdom, relief, joy, comfort. Whatever it may be, Father, we come to you this morning seeking you on a deeper level. God, this morning when we come up to this altar, let us not be thinking about the things going on around us, the things that we have going on after this. Let's not think about the clock. Sometimes our clock is our biggest enemy. Allow us to remember that you've got all the time in the world for us, and that we just have to slow down and tell you what's really on our heart. We pray for every single person that's going to answer this call this morning, every single person that's going to step up and say, I need to just say it to you. Pray that every single person will receive something from you, whether it be guidance, insight, joy, comfort, relief, whatever it is you have for our lives, Lord. We pray it with expectance that you will provide for us when we come to find you on a deeper level. Thank you. We expect amazing things from you.